Many of you have written to me and asked me to express my opinion and provide an analysis of the situation in the Middle East, especially between Israel and the Hamas, but not only. There's Turkey, there's Iran, and so on and so forth. Well, first of all, I have another channel on YouTube. It's called Vaknin Musings. One word, Vaknin Musings. On that channel, you can find interviews that I've given to the various media around the world. You can find my analysis, uh, think thought pieces, and so on and so forth. So head over to Vaknin Musings if you want a lot more than this single video. Number two, I'm a columnist in Brussels Morning, brusselsmorning.com. Head over to brusselsmorning.com, find my columns, and a few of them deal with the situation between Israel and Hamas. Now, as an exception, as a token of my compassion, <laughs> I'm going to upload this video on this channel for 24 hours. Then, at the end of these 24 hours, I'm going to remove this video. I'm going to delete it from this channel. And I'm going to upload it on the other channel, on Vaknin Musings. So you have 24 hours to watch this video here. Well, this channel here is about narcissism and psychopathy and narcissistic abuse. And while admittedly the Israeli-Palestinian conflicts has many elements of narcissistic abuse, still it is a bit out of the remit of this channel. So 24 hours and this video is deleted, erased out of here. And if you want more, and if you want to rewatch this video or watch it for the first time, you should head over to Vaknin Musings. The topic of today's video is who is defeated in Gaza? Is it Israel or is it Hamas? And the reason I'm asking this question is that the human rights champion Khamenei of Iran said that Israel has been defeated in Gaza and all it is doing is invading people's homes and destroying hospitals. In other words, violating human rights, for which, as I said, Khamenei is known as a major champion. Another one is Putin, who is criticizing Israel. And of course, he is the second most famous human rights champion on earth. Okay, but ignore for a minute the tarnished credentials of these bullies and thugs and ask yourself, is Khamenei right? Does he have a point? Has Israel been defeated in Gaza? Or at least, has it been stymied and thwarted? Has the much vaunted Israeli offensive boggled down? Has it been scuppered somehow? Rewind a bit. Hamas has had three goals in their incursion into Israel on October 7th. Number one, to provoke a regional war, derail the peace process between Israel and Saudi Arabia, and reassert the long-forgotten Palestinian cause. Number two, to capture hostages and trade these hostages for Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails. And number three, to humiliate Israel, to expose Israel's army as a paper tiger and to do away with Israel's deterrence. Hamas failed quite spectacularly in accomplishing the first goal. Iran's bombast notwithstanding, Iran has made sure that none of its many proxies declare an all-out war on Israel. They're very careful not to cross the line. Hamas consequently found itself isolated. Many Arab regimes would love to see it go, <laughs> actually. Again, the Arab states have abandoned the Palestinians to their fate, as they have largely done since 1948. But, having said that, Hamas did accomplish the second and third targets on the aforementioned list. Hamas sucked Israel into a war that it cannot hope to win. No military guerrilla group supported by the indigenous people has ever been defeated in battle, let alone eradicated. Not in, not in Vietnam, 
not in Cuba, not in Afghanistan, nowhere, period. If there's a terrorist group, resistance, resistance movement, a guerrilla movement group, and they are supported by the local population, they are, their goals are the goals of the local population, they get, they get access to the resources of the local population, forget about it. You cannot destroy such a movement. Never mind how strong you are. Never mind what is the asymmetry between your power and their power on paper. And here we are, six weeks after the atrocities committed in South Israel by 3,000 Gaza Palestinians. I'm using the phrase Gaza Palestinians rather than the habitual Hamas, because by now it has become clear that the mob who breached the fence in the wake of the 1,000 or so Hamas fighters, this mob has committed most of the heinous and graphic crimes that we have been exposed to. Hamas terrorists, actually, were relatively disciplined throughout the 12 to 24 hours incident. Shockingly, it took the hollowed and hallowed IDF, Israeli Defense Forces, that long to reach the scene in any meaningful way. And so, having endured and experienced this external shock, Israel reacted the way any traumatized individual does. It promulgated delusional goals. And having promulgated delusional goals for its invasion, Israel then dawdled for three unnecessary and costly weeks before it mustered the courage and the determination to penetrate the aerially devastated Gaza, Gaza Strip. And then, having invaded the Gaza Strip, a stream of triumphant messages followed the ground invasion. Alas, reality and self-congratulatory propaganda rarely meet. In actuality, only 2 to 4 percent or 3 percent of Hamas's fighting force and tunnels have been destroyed. Yes, you've heard correctly, 2 to 3 percent. Hamas is even more present in the south, near the Egyptian border. It is more present there than in the much bombarded and invaded north. Hamas is still firing rockets on Israel. Hamas is still holding on to hostages. Hamas is negotiating brazenly for the release of the women and the children among the hostages in exchange for what amounts to a ceasefire. In short, Hamas is far from being intimidated or definitely far from capitulating. Hamas is taunting Israel daily. International diplomatic support for Israel is being sorely tasted, tested by what is beginning to be widely perceived as Israel's campaign of collective punishment, a war crime, may I remind you. Antisemitism is rife globally, and public opinion is decidedly pro-Palestinian. The underdog is always favored. Hamas's own offenses, Hamas's own crimes, are swept under the social media collective carpet. So what is Israel to do? Having backed itself into a corner, the only thing Israel can do and should do is to declare victory and negotiate a ceasefire replete with the release of all the civilian hostages held by various militant and Islamist groups in Gaza. Extending the war, the war to the southern part of Gaza may net a few dead Hamas leaders. Yes, many Hamas leaders would die. But this has been tried before. This has been tried before multiple times, and it never worked. It never led anywhere. Decapitating Hamas is meaningless because it grows a new head. There's a fair chance of cool heads prevailing, unfortunately. 
Israel is led by a kleptocracy, kleptocracy of grandiose malignant narcissists and petty criminals immured in fantasies. And they are led by Benjamin Netanyahu, whose only priority is, and always has been, Benjamin Netanyahu. The political echelons in Israel are estranged from the people and much hated and resented. Israel is actually in the throes of a slow motion, simmering civil war. The military arm of Hamas, on the other side of the equation, because we are talking now about can we find any reasonable, rational, cool-headed person to stop this madness? Well, not on the Israeli side. What about Hamas? The military arm of Hamas is a fanatical and tyrannical death cult. Death cult. Headed by arch psychopaths and serial killers who propagate their own brand of fake for Islam. One example, Sinwar. The political leadership is saner, but it is equally trapped in fantasies of revenge and restoration. Both sides live in fantasy land. Both sides have lost their reality testing. And yet, unlike Al-Qaeda, unlike ISIS, and much like Hezbollah, Hamas is supported by 31 to 53 percent of the Palestinian population who have little left to lose. Additionally, both Hamas and Hezbollah are numerous, about 150,000 warriors, fighters combined. Both outfits are well trained and well equipped. I think that Hamas and Hezbollah combined are a definite match to the IDF's best. They, they are definitely going to give the Israeli Defense Forces a run for their money. It is therefore impossible to exterminate Hamas the way the West has dealt with ISIS, for instance, because ISIS had no support in the population. It imposed itself on the population. That's not the case with Hamas which is essentially a grassroots operation. Many on both sides of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict now say that the only solution to the conflict between the Palestinians and the Israelis, a conflict that has been going on since 1882, by the way. So many voices on both, in both camps are now saying that the only solution is ethnic cleansing. One of these two peoples has to ethnically cleanse the other. Either the Jews ethnically cleanse the Palestinians or the Palestinians ethnically cleanse the Israelis. There's no other solution. So, um, the revived idea of transfer on the Israeli side and Palestine from the river to the sea, to the sea on the Arab side these are the expressions, genocidal expressions, of desperation. Because what have you? The two-states solution is a pipe dream. It's totally non-implementable, deranged <laughs> and inane. Just look at the map. There's no way to connect the West Bank with Gaza without dissecting and disemboweling Israel. Israel will never agree to this. There are 700,000 settlers in the West Bank. What are we going to do? What is Israel going to do with them? And how can Israel safeguard against terrorism once these two parts have combined into a state? So the two-state solution is, again, a pipe dream, an American pipe dream, pro probably. The one-state solution is, of course, totally untenable. Because if Israel were to agree to the incorporation of all Palestinians as equal citizens, it would, it would cease to be Jewish. And if it would not agree to their incorporation, it would cease to be democratic. So it seems the only solution is to throw all the Jews to the sea, as the Palestinians have been demanding since 19, 
36 actually, or to transfer all the Palestinians to Jordan or a similar country, as many Israelis have been suggesting since 1948. Both parties maintain maximal positions and victimhood grievances. Both parties insist on possessing 100% of the territory of Palestine or Israel, depending which camp you belong to. And currently, Israel is poised to exact revenge on Gazans for the October 7th atrocities. It fervently wishes to destroy the Hamas. But even if, implausibly, Israel were to succeed, Hamas is the symptom. Hamas is not the disease. The disease is the Israeli occupation of territories with millions of Palestinians. If Israel is successful at eradicating Hamas, another Hamas will come, will come forth. Another resistance or terrorist organization will take its place. Hamas is a new phenomenon. It's been established in the 80s. It's an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood. The Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood. It's, it's, it's been long preceded by the likes of Fatah and others. So it's just one in a long chain of organizations. The first one of which can be traced back to the 1930s. So the same applies to Hezbollah, of course, even more so. There's no way to eradicate the popular wish. The popular wish of the Palestinians is reified in these organizations. Palestinians regard the Israelis as colonizing invaders, as the modern, modern uh, reincarnation of the Crusaders in the 13, 12th and 13th centuries. So the Palestinians say, most Palestinians say, that Israel, Israel has been created in sin the sin of colonialism. Now, out of expediency, some Palestinians have accepted Israel's right to exist. But deep inside, they perceive this as a temporary pause in a war that may last for centuries and that will end inevitably with an Arab victory. Many people say that this is a religious war. It's partly true. The vast majority of operators, terrorists, activists, <clears throat> politicians, thinkers are Muslims. But there's been a hefty, hefty and consequential presence of Christian Arabs, especially among the terrorist groups in the 70s. So it wouldn't be 100% correct to cast it in terms of a religious conflict or a clash of civilizations. No, it's a simple war over resources. It's a conflict over territory. The Jews, the Israelis feel that they are with the back to the wall, having endured the Holocaust in Europe. They have nowhere to go, nowhere left to go. Israel is the last stand. Israel is the modern Masada. And the Palestinians feel that it is unfair that they have been rendered internally displaced, wrongly called refugees, by the way. Technically, they are not refugees. They are internally displaced. They have been, some of them, not all of them, some of them, of them have, been, have been expelled from their own villages and have, have had to give up on their lands and, and houses. Others left voluntarily. It's important to mention. I refer you to the magisterial works by Benny Morris. Israel is a paper tiger. The Israeli Defense Force is in bad shape, having, having endured budget cuts and, and worse, internal strife between left and right, religious and secular. So it's in bad shape, similar to the Russian army. These are paper tigers. Should Israel be confronted with aggression on several fronts, Lebanon, 
Syria, the West Bank, Gaza, Israel will be defeated. It does not have the capacity to prevail. And the Americans are well aware of this fact. They are aware of Israel's frailty. And this is why the Americans are moving military assets, substantial military assets, into this region, rather than, for example, into the South China Sea. Iran's potential involvement may lead to an escalation of this local conflict to a regional one akin to Vietnam. Both parties are committing war crimes against civilians habitually. Acts of terrorism, on the one hand, are met with acts of state terrorism. So neither side is a saint. There is a chance, but there is a chance that Israel's actions may force Hezbollah to get involved in Israel's disproportionate reactions to Hezbollah's initial measured provocations was unwise. The idea that this is the time to get rid of all of Israel's enemies is based on a delusional, fantastic, grandiose, inflated, extreme misperception of Israel's real power. I don't know what these political and military leaders are on, but whatever they are on, they should stop taking it, because it is distorting seriously the judgments and ability to um, gauge reality properly. Syria may also support Hezbollah sporadically, as might the Iran-backed militias there and in Iraq. I personally doubt this conflict will involve any other actors. The Palestinians have alienated, literally, all their supporters over the years. Quite a feat, if you ask me. The Palestinians are political, diplomatic and military orphans. They are pawns in the hands of, of uh, the likes of Qatar or Israel or Iran. But luckily for Hamas, its conflict with Israel is just the latest piece in a much bigger political realignment. With China's acquiescence, and then with China's help, directly and indirectly through North Korea, Russia has transformed its invasion of Ukraine into a proxy war with the West. And this led to an escalation in conflicts along the fault lines between East and West, all over the world, including the Middle East, and of course, shortly, Taiwan. We are in the throes of a global reordering of power, similar to the period in the 1950s and 1960s, when the West tried to contain both the USSR and communist China. But now, the United States is a much diminished and spent force. It is polarized. It is paralyzed. Its democracy is threatened from within. It doesn't even have a regular budget, only stopgap ones. The USA can scarcely provide military aid to more than two allies or proxies at any given time. NATO is underfunded and under-trained. Under As Ukraine and Israel are going to find out very soon, the West is not a reliable or long-term ally. The axis of resistance, Iran, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, uh, Hamas, the axis of, resi of resistance is becoming aware of the fact that the West is not what it used to be, that it is a facade, a Potemkin force, power. In any fight, in this fight between West and East, taking place on multiple fronts all over the world, is the only thing that is still sustaining um, phenomena such as Hamas and Hezbollah. The emergence of the BRICS group of countries. BRICS used to be China, Russia, South Africa, Brazil, 
Now they've invited Iran to join. Imagine, slap in the face of the United States. So, exactly as the United States will not let Israel fall, the axis of resistance, backed by the likes of China and Russia and so on, will not let its own soldiers, Hamas, Hezbollah, it will not let them fall. This is a war by proxy. And Israel found itself, perhaps, for the first time in its existence, a total, unmitigated, utter pawn in a chess game, not able, in effect, to influence its fate and destiny, not able to make independent decisions, almost at all. Now, of course, Israel has collaborated with colonial powers in the past, most notably in 1956, the invasion of the Suez Canal, the Sinai War, as the Israelis call it. But Israel has always maintained strict independence, always had its, its, its mind, always listened to advice, but then acted the way it saw fit. That's not the situation now. Netanyahu, Netanyahu keeps making grandiose claims as to red lines and, you know, fuel will never enter Gaza. A week later or two weeks later, fuel enters Gaza. There will be no ceasefire. Well, shortly there's going to be a ceasefire. Israel is not an independent decision maker. It's the long arm of the interests of the West, mostly the United States, but also the European Union. The interest of the West is to put a halt, establish a boundary, a line in the sand, where China, Russia, its allies and its proxies, such as Iran, will not be able to cross. And if they do, the West will fight them to the last Israeli.